A couple of days ago, I got the chance to catch up with Laura from Brew Coffee and Kitchen. Uh, Laura's been one of our clients for a little while now, but recently she's undergone quite a few changes. Laura, in the last seven months, has managed to increase her revenue by a whopping 94.6%. And I wanted to ask her a few questions to find out how she did it, what went right, what went wrong, and if there's anything she'd do different. Um, obviously, there was a point for you when you were just scraping by, um, or not even scraping by because you couldn't take a wage. What was it like at that point? Oh, horrible. It was kind of like a situation where I thought to myself, what have I done? I had, I would say, a successful career in pharmacy for 18 years. I had a good job, um, good wage. My husband had a good job. Um, he also had a good wage. Um, so we quit and joined the hospitality land and literally couldn't afford to take a wage for ourselves. It was like, it was such a shock to the system. And I think until you're inside running a business, you have no idea what's coming and what to expect. I think a lot of people think, oh, I'll open a coffee shop or I'll just open a little, little restaurant and it'll just be dead easy and I can just sit at the bar drinking or whatever. And it was nothing like that, nothing at all. So yeah, it was rough, not gonna lie. And obviously we had lockdown, um, so, We'd only been open just on 12 months and then the country got shut down. So obviously we had our first year, which was, you know, your first year's a write-off anyway. And then lockdown. So it was really rough. No, it, it is. And I think everybody's been kind of caught in this. Anybody who opened pre-COVID, unless they've been going for a really long time beforehand, most places didn't have the cash to actually get through COVID. No. Or some businesses, the ones that started during COVID, um, seem to have done really, really well because they didn't have that blip in the middle. They, they started with nothing yeah. at the hardest possible time. Um, but other than, obviously, COVID played a big factor in the business kind of not really moving anywhere. But do you think, on a personal note, there was anything that you did wrong and could have done? Obviously, hindsight's twenty twenty. Anything you did wrong that could have been done better yeah. with the knowledge that you've got now definitely preparation is the key prepare 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 because I went in blind I had no idea what I was doing and that influenced my decision making um because I was basically just winging it and I still am winging it but with a little bit more knowledge um so definitely um before opening I would have prepared more waited longer before opening because we kind of got the keys and then two weeks later we were open and um, I didn't really think about custom my menu I took a lot of advice off chefs who I had working for me and all great chefs no hard feelings to anybody but they didn't necessarily have the knowledge of running a business either and you just take advice off different people and it's not necessarily the right advice so, yeah, I would definitely say pre preparation and doing your sums. No, of course. It's mm. a thing that I probably sing about all the, <laughs> all the time, and it's the first thing I look at when I go into a new business is how's it been costed? Um, and obviously I remember when I gave you that sheet the first time around to cost out your menu, mm. and you came back to me with, I've done the first three, and they're at 50%. Um, but obviously <laughs> when you've gone through them all, you changed your prices and and – and it, then it, I suppose that that was one of your starting points for going, oh, um, but I suppose the next question is, what did you change? And I suppose what made you want to change what you were doing? Because obviously you've had significant growth over the past kind of seven months that most places can't really, no, very few places can jump up by nearly 100% inside of seven months. So you've done amazing. But so something had to change. So what was it? And what, what made you want to change and what did actually change? I think I've wanted to change for a long time, um, but just not really had the support behind me. Um, I think the first change was changing my accountant. So, I mean, like, I don't want to sound cheesy or anything, but like you've really helped us understand hospitality and it's just having that key advice and somebody to ask you the questions in black and white to make you think about it, you know, like this business is either going to end up in liquidation or you're going to do something about it. So we decided to do something about it and we just 
worked hard, looked at all our figures. And I think like when we were costing things, I was more, well, my husband's more like looking at the menu and he was saying things like, I wouldn't pay £10 for a breakfast, but it doesn't matter what you think people will pay. It's what it is costing you. You can't sell something at a loss or you haven't got a business. No, of course, but I suppose, I suppose we, we spoke about the what you're charging kind of thing because I have the same conversation with a lot of people in terms of I wouldn't pay that. But then when we speak on more of a personal level, it's like, well, just because you can't afford it doesn't mean that other people can't. And then that that's one of the things that led to you actually being able to take a wage and then obviously the the change in your mind that when the money's in your bank compared to the business bank you can kind of look at your menu and go well that price needs to go up because suddenly you can actually you can be one of those people that can afford to be in there when yeah, you exactly. pay yourself the, the right amount of money for being there well when we first increased the prices we were really nervous and i think the prices had been the same for probably three years and in that time the whole country had changed, the cost of living had changed, and we just kept the prices the same because we were scared to go up. And to be honest with you, there was no backlash of any customers. Nobody said anything, and in fact, we're probably busier. We changed the menu, we enhanced the menu, we did up our prices. Some things went up by like a pound, some things only by 20 pence, depending. Um, but nobody really kicked up a fuss. But so... the. That's that's why you changed, and one of the things that you did change was your menu pricing, but what else kind of changed for you? Because menu pricing on its own doesn't necessarily double your revenue because you didn't double prices. You might have gone up by, like you said, a pound here, 20p there, just to make sure that you were in line with the GP figure that you actually wanted. Um, what else did you do on your side that either changed your mind or... That, you, that you've gone out and physically done to go, oh, there's, there's no actual money coming in through here. It's, it's hard It's hard to say what's actually changed, but I think I've just looked at the business from the outside rather than like trying to work in it because I do find that I get bogged down. Like if I end up doing a shift in the kitchen or I'm ending up being in front of house or I'm making cakes, I'm not actually working on the business. So I took a step away and started looking at how the business is running and I've put more into my social media um, and the advertising um, and trying to work on the branding a little bit and putting that out there. But so I don't know whether that is like one of the main things that have changed. No, it's, it's all small contributing factors. It's trying to remove yourself away from some of the day-to-day -day, um, so that you can focus on a little bit and then once you focused on that little bit, you can focus on a little bit more. It's the thing that I talk yeah. about called um, compounding effectiveness. Like it takes one small job for for everything to kind of change very, very quickly because it, yeah. it compounds as you go. Yeah, well, I've started um, from your advice though as well. I've started like delegating jobs, like not that they're not worth my time, but I've got so many jobs to do that it pays to pay somebody to do it even if it's something small because it just takes that stress away from me and then I can concentrate on the bigger things no absolutely if you're the one driving the business there's far more that you can generate for it than you can save by pouring a cup of coffees yourself obviously yeah. if it's busy and you've got to jump on you've got to jump on but it's ultimately to me and I'm sure you agree it's about having the choice of yeah. whether or not you want to be behind the counter that day. And if you do, absolutely fine. Go and do it. But the following day, if you don't, then you can just take yourself off the rotor and go, well, I was surplus anyway. I don't actually need to be here. Yeah, exactly. Because I think that's when you get like bogged down. And that's like where I was with the first question. And like I felt like I couldn't step away. And I wasn't gaining anything from it. And I wasn't getting anything from it at all, not even a wage. No, of course, it's it's hard to give up control when it's yours, even if you're not the right one to be doing certain aspects of it. It's really difficult to kind of pass some of those off because you you get stuck in kind of analysis, per, analysis paralysis. Well, what if that goes wrong? What if they don't do this? What if they yeah. don't do that? How am I going to check on them? When mm -hmm. you're not actually doing that job anyway and you're panicking about somebody else not doing that job, when in yeah. reality... 
passing all of those small tasks out is likely to get done by somebody else because you know you're telling them they're doing it and it's part of their job and they've got to do it whereas you're the owner so if you don't want to do it you don't have to or you don't find the time so is realistic now that you've doubled revenue well nearly doubled revenue i'll make sure i'll be uh, really clear mm -hmm. um what are you going to do to either keep it keep it up and keep it where it is or keep it growing well i just think seeing the figures has kind of given me that like buzz that incentive to like want to work on it and to want to make it better you know like when you get in a rut um you just think oh, i just can't be asked and you just get through each day whereas now that i can see that things have changed and i've got the figures and I can see that it, everything is going the right way, then I only want to enhance that. So I want to work on bringing in new things. And um, we're going to look at, well, we've already talked about this, but um, bringing in other delivery apps like Uber Eats, um, possibly Deliveroo. And then we're going to look at possibly in the future doing some kind of evening pop up events. I don't really want to tie myself to saying let's open of an evening because I've done that before, not an evening, but like I've said, I'll do something and then not really thought about how it's all going to work. And ultimately, like when it's your business, everything falls onto you. So if you've got staffing issues, money issues, whatever, and you're open, I don't know, 12 hours a day or whatever, then if people are off sick, you've got to cover. So I kind of want to keep it daytime and then we'll just do fun things every now and again. Well, that's that's perfect. Um, just to go off topic from that slightly, and then I'll if Tommy wants to ask you a couple of questions, he can. Um, I spoke to. I was hoping that Carly would be on today from Forklift Vegan because something I spoke to her yesterday about was she was like, well, we want to look at opening at lunchtime rather than just being mm -hmm. takeaway of an evening. Um, what can we do? Will this work? Like, well, the, the first thing to do when you want to make any kind of drastic change that you think is going to benefit the business, find out, go on social media, do a poll, get as much demand as possible. Um, and then when it comes to your first event, you have a massive run up as a minimum, like eight weeks beforehand, push it really hard on social media, get everybody to book, pay a deposit, anybody that does book and pay a deposit or pays in full there and then. They might get a free bottle of wine or something like that for, for pre-booking and pre-paying. So that way you already know what your numbers are before it's it's done and it costs you. And at that point, that event is already paid for by the people who haven't even gone to it yet. Because I think that's where I've made mistakes before, where like a couple of customers may say, oh, you should do this. You should open later or, you know, bring in this idea or whatever and because one or two customers have said it you think the demand's there when actually it's just one or two customers so I definitely agree with like doing your research because I did that with Angie's as well and um, people said that we should open later in the night but I didn't do enough research I didn't advertise it enough and we weren't busy enough so it does pay to advertise and be in people's faces and also listen to your customers <laughs> Apologies for the video cutting off when it did. I'm still new to the tech side of things, but that pretty much was the end of the interview. If you've got any questions for myself or Laura, feel free to leave a comment below the video. And if you'd like to do one of these with me, then just let me know. Cheers.